Great. So thanks for having me, uh, everybody. And uh, so I'll be, uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to monitor the chat, but if there's a question, please feel free to uh, ask or uh, maybe Rico can uh, translate for me. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, some recent work that I've been doing with uh, uh, Amit Kumar and Devmadhya Panikrahi on uh, uh, covering LP relaxation for K-Server and an extension to time windows. And uh, the, the paper will be on the archive soon, but uh, we're still uh, cleaning it up a little bit. But let me tell you about it. So uh, so the, the, the problem is the K-Server problem. And just in case you haven't seen the, uh, the problem before, let me uh, quickly uh, remind you what it is. You're given a metric space on uh, endpoints and uh, they, you control K servers. So, so these red blobs here are K servers that the algorithm controls. And at every point in time, there's a request and the request comes at one of the nodes, uh, one of the points in this metric space. And what you have to do is you have to move one of the servers in order to, to that location. If there isn't a server already, of course, at that location. And then there's a new request. And of course, these requests are coming online. So you don't know the future. And uh, what you want to do is you want to minimize the total distance that are traversed by the servers. So this is a classic problem going back to a work by Manasseh Magu and uh, Slater in 90. And uh, as in previous talks, we are interested in competitive analysis. So it's the same definition again, just to make sure uh, you're on board. This is the competitive ratio and we are allowing some additive terms out here. And in particular, for most of the K-server uh, results, there are some additive terms which depend on the, the metric space, but not on the actual request sequence that it sees. So I don't want anything that depends on the length of the input sequence, for instance. Uh, so that's the uh, K-server problem. And you know, here's a little example. So for instance, suppose I had this tree and this tree was defining the metric. Shortest part distances in this tree uh, give you the metric. And there are three servers that are sitting at A, B, and C. And suppose I repeatedly give you requests at uh, U0 and U1. So when you first see the request at uh, U0 and U1, you would be tempted to move servers from A, from the local uh, servers, uh, in order to satisfy it, because you don't know the future. But of course, after a little while, you should see that uh, moving a server from B over, or may maybe moving both the servers from B and C over to U0 and U1, would be able to satisfy these with finite uh, time. Whereas if you just run greedy, which is to move the closest server over, that's a bad algorithm because that will, uh, it'll pay one at every time, whereas you could just, uh, you know, move. Uh, let me see if I can write something. You can, uh, you can move these two guys over, and uh, move these two guys over uh, to these two locations and satisfy them for good. You know, with a finite amount of time. Okay, so uh, hopefully the problem is clear to everybody. And I'll very quickly, you know, this is a sort of long history. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. For the deterministic case, the problem is essentially solved. There's a factor of two. It would be great to solve it, but I'm not worried about that right now. For the randomized case, the lower bounds are like log k. And for a long time, it wasn't known how to do uh, poly log approximations. So here are what are known. Uh, the results that are known and several people are in the audience. So there are basically poly log in the various parameters of the problem. You know, N, the number of points in the metric space, K, the number of servers, or delta, which is the, like the maximum to minimum distance ratio in the metric space. And uh, in particular, a lot of this uh, work goes via something called HSTs, so maybe I'll, I'll just remind you what HSTs are in the next slide. Uh, it, uh, yeah, so, so, so this is the work known. And also maybe I should mention that this problem generalizes the paging problem. So those of you who have seen it, for paging, the answer is completely understood, but for K-server, the problem uh, is still uh, quite interesting. Okay. So most of the work is going to be on these things called HSTs. And you should just really think of these as these very sort of symmetric looking trees where the edge lengths increase exponentially. And think of lambda as being much larger than one. So the edge lengths increase exponentially as you go up and all the edges at the same level have the same, uh, uh, have the same length. So it's a very well-structured tree. And we would like to understand uh, the case over for these uh, trees 
once you understand it for these trees, you lose the log factor more and you can go to any uh, general metric using randomization. And of course we are using randomization, so that's, that's fine. And, of, and we'll use this idea that, you know, randomized algorithms and fractional algorithms, again, have this sort of uh, close connection between them. We'll just give fractional algorithms. There is, a randomiz there is a rounding step that uses randomization at the very end, and I won't even talk about it. So really, I want to solve the fractional problem. And in the fractional problem, if you are given a request at a location, you must have like one unit of server out there. And in fact, you know, all these are very robust. It's okay to have one minus epsilon units of server out there for some tiny, teeny tiny epsilon. And you know, things work out. Okay. So what, what are we, what am I going to briefly talk about is a new, um, possibly a new, we couldn't uh, find a uh, reference to this, but it's connected to things we know, a covering relaxation for, uh, for the problem on these kind of uh, trees, hierarchically well-separated trees. So these are HSTs. And uh, using this covering relaxation, we'll give a new algorithm, which has a polylog uh, comparative ratio in, in some of the parameters. And though it's not the best known by, by any means, but uh, the fact that we are using a covering relaxation is new. The previous paper of Sebastian and others, Bubek, uh, Cohen, Lili, and Madri, was using a, a, a relaxation which wasn't a covering problem, so they had to uh, they had to do more work or a different kind of work in order to solve those uh, convex relaxations, linear programs even. But for us, it's a covering problem. It's a, it's, a, it's a natural one, and I'll explain what it is. And one advantage of this is, you know, apart from understanding the problem a little better, which we would like to do, things extend to this notion of time windows. So now I could give you a K server instance with time windows saying that, look, you, you don't need to move the server to this leaf right now, but move it within the next you know, 10 seconds or move it within the next 30 minutes or something like that. I'll give you a time window. At this point, I, the request arrives and it must be served within the next, uh, you know, uh, whatever, L time units. Well, L can be arbitrary. So previously there was a deterministic algorithm for this. And it wasn't clear how to use the previous techniques to extend randomized algorithms or fractional algorithms to this setting. And the advantage of our relaxation is that the, a similar relaxation, similar algorithm, similar proof goes through. New ideas are needed, but you know, that's the... So it suggests that this covering relaxation might have some advantages that uh, make it interesting. So more or less, I'm going to... My, my goal is to give you the covering relaxation. Hopefully, you, you know, hopefully you'll understand it. And I'll give you a very impressionistic sketch. There's only so much one can do in 30 minutes of the, uh, what the algorithm is doing. Okay, so here's the relaxation. So let's just assume that every request is associated with a unique uh, time, you know, unique in integer, okay? And I'm going to have variables X, V comma T, which is, in your mind, you should think of this as an indicator that the server goes from a vertex V, some vertex V, to its parent. So it goes up at some time t. That's the main idea of what XVT is supposed to mean. Okay. And just like, you know, in the natural way, I'll extend this to interval. So instead of uh, just allowing it to be for a single time step, I'll say XVI. And so the relaxation will have constraints which look like this. For any subset of requests, and I've given you a subset of requests on the right-hand side, you'll see there's some integers that have appeared. So those leaves were requested at that time. Now, given these subset of requests and at these leaves, let tau v be the maximum time that this vertex v sees below it. So here are the values of tau v. So 11 here just means that in this subtree, there's a request, the, the latest request was the time 11. Okay, good. So now I've defined these tau v values for all the internal, for all the internal nodes, which have a children in this subset and all the other vertices I'll remove. So I'll just focus on this subtree. And here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to take 
the x variables for every vertex in this subtree over the interval going from its own uh, tau value to its parent tau value. And I'm going to sum this up for every vertex B of the graph. Okay? And I say that this is at least A minus K. So for instance, let me just uh, show you what, uh, uh, you know, let, let's, let's see what on this particular example, what this constraint says. So notice that these variables, the intervals are of length zero. So there's no terms on the left-hand side of this constraint. On this edge, the interval goes from three to 11. So this says that I will look at the times between three and 11 for this vertex A. And I look at how many, how much mass, how much server mass goes from A to its parent in this time interval. And I do this for every vertex of the graph. I sum this up and I say that, well, the total amount of server movement in this time period must be at least the number of requests that are there minus K, the number of uh, servers. Okay. And that's, those are my constraints. And those are all my constraints. So notice that if A were of size K, then clearly this is you know, not saying anything meaningful because you know, the K servers could be sitting at those locations in A already. Maybe there was no movement at all. But if, K is, if A is bigger than K, then this is starting to say, well, there must be some movement. And this is a somewhat stylized, you know, you could just say that I'll look at this subtree and there must be four units of movement in there because, uh, you know, uh, A minus K is whatever, four or something like this maybe. But I want to say, well, no, this is a slightly more stylized coupling relaxation. So are there questions about this? Yeah, uh, Anupam, so Please. Is, is, are these tau Vs defined um, after I've seen the entire request sequence or is it like the request sequence up to now? So, so this is, uh, you should think of this as uh, take uh, A, which is a subset of the requests until now. Tau V is the max, is just dependent on A. Ah, okay, I see. So for all of the requests that you've seen so far, you have an inequality for every subset of those. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, this I, is some okay. cra crazy covering relaxation, right? I mean, yeah, horrendous. I got, uh, you. I got you. Absolutely. So once you fix an A, tau's are fixed, and then this constraint should be well defined. Okay. It might also help. I'll, I'll, I'll show you why this relaxation is a valid one. Uh, so one thing that I can say, you know, two things. For those of you, just uh -huh. a, please. A, a clarification question. Please. So the subset of request is viewed as a, a set of locations, not a set of times. It's a set of, you should think of this as a set of location comma time pairs. Okay, so, location comma time. Okay, cool. So, 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 so if this guy had a request at time one as well, you could write down a constraint where this is replaced by one and a similar thing would be true. Actually, I don't know if I'm happy with that because then is it true the size of A minus K is the amount of movement? Because like there could be one location which is repeated many times, but I already have a server there. Uh, good. So, 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 so good point, Sebastian. So the thing that I'll make sure is that for any location out here, I will choose only one time in A. Okay, cool. Thanks. Fair enough. Other questions, please. Okay, so uh, uh, this, by the way, is an extension of the uh, uh, LP for paging, for those of you who've seen it before, but you know. And uh, another fact that I can say is that one way to solve K server, you might think, well, how do I solve K server offline? Well, you solve it using some min cost flow. And uh, this, this LP is implied by that min cost flow, which would prove uh, that it's a feasible LP. But let me give you a direct proof that this is feasible. So here's the thing. I'll show you that constraints of this form that I just, uh, uh, just wrote down 
are feasible. And here is some set A out here. Okay. Now, fix an optimal algorithm. And I want to show that the optimal algorithm is going to satisfy this constraint. And fix any server. So there are K servers. And let AS be the uh, locations visited by servers, one of these servers in this subset. Okay. So of all these requests, I'm going to remove all the, uh, the, all the requests that were not served by uh, server S, let's say the first server, and the ones that remain are these. Okay. And I've just written down the tau values uh, that were there for this, uh, for, for the internal nodes. Okay. And th this, this solution, this, this, uh, this optimal algorithm naturally gives you a solution to this LP. Remember, it's just when, you know, you'll set X V T equals one. If this server goes from V to its parent at some time T. And I want to show that this constraint, now this constraint is exactly like the left-hand side of this, but I'm focusing only on server S. This constraint is exactly like this, except I'm focusing on the intersection of A with S, and I'm only subtracting off one. Now, if this claim were true for every server S, I could sum this up and get exactly the constraint I wanted on the right-hand side. Oh, Anupam, just another quick Please. clarification question. Sure. Like the server going from V to its parent, I mean, I guess like the server can go from anywhere to anywhere uh, in one time step. So we just mean like it crosses the parent? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So th if the server went from here to there, then all these three edges would have excess equals one. So I want to show this, this, this claim only for the server S. So basically I'm looking at this tree out here and I want to say that look at all the edges where the server crossed the edge at some time in the appropriate intervals. They must be at least a, AS minus one, okay? Suppose not. So here you'll notice that AS is of size four. So I want to say that there must be at least three edges uh, sorry, uh, AS is of size five, so there must be at least four edges which the server crossed in the appropriate time intervals. And I'll say, suppose not. Suppose there were only three. Then this means that there are two requests which belong to the same interval, uh, which belong to the same connected subtree. Okay. So delete all the edges that the server crossed, let's say. So there are two requests which belong to the same connected component. So the server was here at time one, the server was there at time eight, but this doesn't add up, right? So how could it have gone from here at time one to here at time eight without crossing these guys in the appropriate intervals? And that's the idea. And you can see that these, the, these intervals that I've given are essentially the sort of the best you could hope for for this kind of constraints that you're writing. Good. Any other questions about these constraints? And I'm going much slower than I, uh, I was anticipating, but that's that's perfectly fine. And I would like you to understand the constraints, the LP, more than uh, the. Okay. So, you know, speak up if not, but otherwise maybe I'll give you a sense of how I use this LP. So, uh, you know, the standard online uh, primal dual uh, paradigm size says write an LP relaxation, then raise the primal to get a fractional solution and then raise the dual and charge the primal to the dual with some loss. So our algorithm, you know, what, okay. So let, let me not philosophize. Let me give you a sense of what our algorithm. So, you know, what might happen is we want to use this LP. So a new constraint comes. Suppose we wrote down all the, uh, sorry, a new uh, request comes at this location. So suppose I wrote down all the exponentially many constraints that corresponded to this new request. You know, it's for every subset and things like that. Let's not worry about how I would solve this. Suppose I could even do that. Now, if it, if this, 
uh, if the X variables on these edges would increase, I would move servers from within the subtree. I would move servers from the siblings of this vertex V over. On the other hand, if you increase the uh, X variables on this top tree, I would move servers over from other subtrees. But the problem with, with this sort of fractional relaxation is maybe, you know, somehow the LP says, oh, I'm going to increase some variables here and there. And I'm going to satisfy your constraints. Your constraints are satisfied. Or even worse, it says, aha, the, the solution I gave you at the previous time step already had satisfied all the new constraints you wrote. There's nothing more to do. So you're kind of in a bind. And this was, this was a major problem we were facing while trying to uh, uh, use this LP. So what we do instead is a slightly different thing. So here's what we do. Uh, we define an algorithm, which is almost like a combinatorial algorithm. And we use the LP to guide this combinatorial algorithm. So let me, let me give you a, a, a better sense. So here's the thing. Every leaf is going to have between some delta and one minus delta servers. Think of delta and one minus delta as very tiny, like one over poly. And think of a leaf uh, like being satisfied if it has one minus delta servers. That's all I need. I don't need one unit of server. I need one minus delta unit of server. And you know, I have stuff to give away. I can give away stuff. I'm active if I have more than delta servers. If I have exactly delta servers, I can't go below. So I'm, I'm, I'm dead for all practical purposes. I'm empty for all practical purposes. This is just some technicalities, but you know, whatever. Maybe I should have skipped this. As well. So the algorithm is kind of the following. I got a request at V0. What I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer some servers from its immediate siblings, some servers from the next level siblings, some servers from the next level siblings, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to hedge. You know, in online algorithms, if there's one thing we learn, it's like you got to hedge your bets. So I'm going to spend an equal amount of cost on each of these levels, which means I'm transferring much more aggressively from my immediate neighbors than from guys who are further away, than from guys who are far, even further away. Okay, that's the main idea. I mean, it's 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 a standard hedging idea. The, and here's how we'll, we'll prove things, okay? It's very high level, you know? It's, it's like, okay, the, what's, you know, I'm paying epsilon at each one of H levels, let's say. So the total cost I'm paying is epsilon times H, okay? The thing that I have to show is that somehow I'll increase the dual by epsilon and that the dual is nearly feasible. Again, one can combine this together, but this is the sort of natural uh, thing. And so this gives us some polylog competitive aspect. Let's not worry about the parameters per se. But the main idea is at every level, I want to pay about the same amount. Very natural sort of idea that you might try. And there are sort of two things, which is, you know, which servers to move. So for instance, you know, here I have two siblings, and suppose I have servers at each one of them. Which of these two siblings should I take servers from? Which of these siblings should I take server from? And so on and so forth. That's a question I need to answer. And of course, the million dollar question is how do I need to raise the duals to pay for all this? Okay. okay. So um, here's uh, next, next three minutes, I'll go a little fast. But at least I'll give you, you know, again, impressionistic sketch, right? So I had a constraint of this form. I'm going to write this as a constraint corresponding to each of these three subtrees and a constraint corresponding to the top portion. So for every vertex, I look at its children. I'm going to break up this constraint into uh, into uh, portions which correspond to each of the children. And then just the portion that corresponds to just these edges. And I've color coded these things on the left hand side and on the right hand side. I've kind of broken things up. And what this means is somehow I'll, 
I'll write down individual local LPs for each of these three children out here, which will have some fake constraints. And I'll use those fake constraints. I'll combine them together to get real constraints. Okay, maybe, you know, let me, let me say this slightly differently. I'm gonna define a local LP for every vertex. And the, look, the left-hand side of the local LP looks exactly the same. It's a familiar constraint on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it's also exactly the same. You know, I, I'm choosing some subset of vertices, some subset of K, which lie within this subtree. But what's the value of K, the number of servers? And here I'll say, well, it's the number of servers in my subtree, according to my algorithm at some, some particular time. I've just, you know, this, 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 this term is the only term that depends on my own algorithm. Now, of course, if I write constraints of this form, there's no reason that these constraints are feasible at all. So I'm cooking up these local LPs. I think of these as local bank accounts that are useful for my algorithm. The advantage is that the constraints of some subtree, the constraint of the parent, can be combined together, can be obtained in the, in, this, in the way we did on the previous slide, using the constraints for the children. So the bank account for this big tree is related to the bank accounts for the children. And very crucially, let me ignore all this, very crucially, the roots local LP, look at fact B. So fact A exactly said what, I, what, what the previous statement was, that the constraints of the parent are related to the constraints of the child. But the interesting part that I want to point out is that the constraints of the root are actually true constraints. These were the constraints we wrote down. So all these bank accounts are kind of fake money. They're funny money, we are moving things around. But we can relate them, we can relate the bank accounts of the parents to the children, and hence we can relate the bank account of the root to everybody else. And what we'll show is that if you move epsilon amounts, you will increase the dual by epsilon, and that the duals are almost feasible. I realize I, you know, been sort of going a little past, uh, but the sort of main idea I wanted to draw was that we write down this LP. And then based on our algorithm, we write down local LPs, which are not necessarily feasible for the, for the you know, problem per se, but they are used as accounting uh, devices that we can use to charge our uh, algorithm. So uh, there's an extension to time windows, maybe for you know, lack of uh, hard, hard time. I'm going to skip that, and instead I'll just uh, close. So I'll mention uh, that you know this was the covering relaxation for K server. It's a natural one, and uh, it is you know it comes out from the min cost flow formulation. But uh, perhaps it's easy to see on these HSTs, and it's easy to write it down and and argue about it, and um, or easier I should say, and this gives some polylog competitive algorithms for both problems. Uh, it's very likely that we can, you know, get rid of this delta term, but uh, let me not, you know, worry about that. The interesting thing would be making it polylog K, which, which, is, which is a question that's been, uh, uh, sort of ha has been of interest for quite some time. Um, getting something better for time windows, but also simpler and better algorithms. Maybe, you know, this, this covering relaxation seems very natural to uh, us right now, and we hope that uh, you agree. And so the question is, our algorithm is a little complicated with this uh, local LPs. Can we somehow simplify, even conceptually, simplify the algorithm a little bit? So with that, I'll, I'll stop here and take any questions that you have.